You're plugged in to The Real Life Show with your host, Malachi Malay, where real life issues meet real life solutions. Problems are not solitary things. Someone has been through what you're going through. So let's talk about real life. All right. What, when I first started to talk about the stuff that I'm going to talk about now, it would end up with me attempting suicide. I would either overdose. One time I tried to jump off a bridge. I would go very... The pain of what I had to deal with for 25 years that kept me on the street was hell. The shame and the guilt and all the other stuff that goes with uh, being sexually assaulted as a man, especially, never mind, a woman has her issues she has to deal with, but a man has his issues to deal with. At the time of the sexual assault, I definitely wasn't a man. I had left home when I was 16. I had hitchhiked west or east to Quebec City, decided I didn't want to be on the streets, and was making my way back west. My parents wouldn't accept me right back home because I had pretty much destroyed my family relationships at home because I was a runaway and I was getting in trouble at school and trouble with my parents. So I was a troublesome child, a troublesome young man, but I wasn't a troubled person. I left Quebec City and for days I had hitchhiked across Canada. I, there was a man, Aubrey had told me many times about a God in heaven. And Aubrey had told me that if I wanted to find strength, and it's, that's a whole other story all by itself, but my questions had been since I'd, for over a year I'd been reading the Bible, and I wanted to find a place that could teach me the message of what the Bible taught. And uh, I had come across a religious organization when I ended up in Grand Prairie, Alberta. I had been awake for days with little sleep because I had been hitchhiking. I I'd hitchhiked nonstop to get just heading west. I didn't know I was going to go to Grand Prairie. I ended up in Grand Prairie. Uh, I was tired. I went to the social welfare office and I said, is there a shelter in this town? They sent me to Wapiti Lodge in Grand Prairie. Uh, Wapiti Lodge was an organization that was run by, uh, was a shelter run by a religious organization. I went into the front doors. At the front doors there was a man standing behind the desk that had a white shirt on and blue pants and a blue collar, blue shoulder bands on his shoulder. He looked like an officer. He wasn't, he, he looked like a, a soldier, like an officer. And uh, he buzzed me in through the first door, asked me what I wanted, and I told him that the social welfare had sent me to the office, or sent me there for a shelter. He sent me inside the front door and he said, I'll be with you in a few minutes. Um, I was looking around, the place was clean. It was a nice looking place. It actually looked like home for the first time in a long time. I had found a home, somewhere I felt I could be comfortable. Uh, he asked, He about 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, he came out, tapped me on the shoulder and said, now can, how can I help you? I asked him if I could register. This guy started to ask me a lot of questions for registration. And in the process of doing that, he got to know my name and got to know who I was as a person. Asked me why I was so young and on the streets. I told him that I was on my own. Uh, the guy's name was Wayne. I'll just leave the last name out. I, I know the last name. I know what the guy looks like. I, I, I'll never forget that guy. And um, he started to win my confidence. He took the time to get to know me. He took me, he introduced me to the staff. Uh, he started to, I, he asked me what I was looking for. I told him I wanted to find the God that that I had heard about. I wanted to find strength for my health, for myself. I was a troubled, I was just wanted peace. I didn't have peace. And he told me, well, God was able to help me. Uh, he, he went to about taking time to win my confidence. About a week after I'd been there, he told me that there was a, a an addictions course that I could take. Uh, to help me with my drug addiction that I had and my alcohol troubles that I had. 
and that he would sit down and teach me the Bible and uh, he would teach me about the love of God uh, the guy was sick he taught me he, he took he took me to the addictions class he was my addictions counselor he ran the chapel services he really took the time to win my confidence um, he allowed, gave me special privileges I didn't have to go out like the other guys had to go out I was able to stay in the building during the day when, when most of the men in the single shelter had to go out I got to stay in at nights when he was working the front desk he would allow me to sit in his room and listen to the stereo and read and just be apart from everybody else. Um, it was then that he really got deviant. He took several months to win my confidence, or gain my trust, gain my res gain my confidence. He um, listened to me a lot when I had troubles, listened to my story about my questions, and he answered my questions from the Bible. He always would say God was good to me because he brought me to a place where I could meet him and that he could help me. Now this is where it gets interest. This is my, just stay careful with what this goes on here because this is real and this happens. He took, uh, one day I was in the room and I fell asleep in the chair and when I came back uh, from when he when I woke up he was looking over the chair and staring at me he had come into the room and I startled him he had a smile on his face and he uh, he told me that he came in to get something and I looked comfortable and that's all he said to me he said we'll talk later that night when he came back in you know it was a that night when he came back in and he started talking to me and he asked me some really personal questions. He asked me if I was a virgin. He asked me if uh, um, I'd ever um, been, how, how I'd been intimate with women and had I ever been with a man was one of the questions he asked me. That question really made me feel uncomfortable. He sat and left it for a bit and we got talking some more. When we were finished talking for a bit, he leaned forward and gave me a kiss on the lips. That started the, the that I shook, I, I stepped back, and I guess he saw that. Um, he said, you know, don't worry about it. I, I, I'm sorry I startled you. I didn't mean to do that. He took, when, one day he said, you know, God has really been good to you because he has brought you to me so that you can learn what love is all about and he took time and effort to teach tell me that God had made it good possible for men to be with men and uh, he my I was 16 years old I was on my own I had an addiction problem I had no sense of self-worth I had no sense of well-being I had no surf sense of self-identity none of this stuff I had so he was a, I was able to be manipulated very easily. I was a victim right from the word go. Over the next several months he would, uh, or, or weeks, he, he took the time to get close to me again. Yeah, after, I'm going all over the place with this story, but I don't want to get into it as deep as I can because it's rude. But the day that uh, he came into the room, I'll just go straight to the point, he came into the room one day and we had talked for a bit and he leaned forward and kissed me again and he said don't worry about it it's good all good god is with us ah god has brought you to me and i'm here to teach you what love is all about and uh then he started to do what a man likes to do um, uh, when a man is trying to get it on with someone he takes his partner and arouses that partner well, that's what he did to me, but I was confused and I was scared. I didn't know what to do if I said anything. I didn't know if I'd be kicked out of the shelter. If I, I didn't know how to stop it. And uh, he took the time. He led me to the bed where he was, uh, in, the, in his room. And that's when he sodomized me. And that was 
that was the most painful thing I've ever experienced, physically painful experience. He finished what he was doing, pleasured himself with me, got up, gave me a kiss on the head and said, uh, it's our secret. And when he left the room, the physical pain that I felt subsided. It went away. It was not right away. It was a very painful experience. But it was probably the beginning of the pain that I talk about, the rot, the guilt and the shame that I felt here. I felt I was wrong. I felt I'd done wrong. Uh, I didn't know why that happened, how that happened. I didn't think it should have happened. And um, he knew that. And when he came back in later, I was dressed. And he sat down and he talked with me. And he, he calmed me down. And then over the next three months, he repeatedly committed acts on me that I won't even go into describing. But I was a victim because I didn't know how to deal with it. I was 16 years old at that time in 1978. The age of consent for anal intercourse was 21. I was 16. It was rape. It was it was molestation of a minor. Uh, it was um, breach of fiduciary duty. Uh, it was him taking advantage of a position of authority that he had and lording it over me. And that was that was the main reason why I ran for 25 years, was trying to get rid of that guilt and that shame. That's pretty much it. I can go into it, other details and other angles, but that's just off the top of my head. That's just, unless you've got any questions, that's pretty raw. That's just the bare bones facts. So when it happened, did you question your sexuality? I didn't know what my sexuality was. I had no idea what sexuality was all about. All I know is that one minute he got me so aroused, and the next minute he got me into so much pain, I didn't know how to deal with it. I was confused, very confused. My sexuality uh, was in question for several years afterwards because I didn't know what was going on. Uh, I'm definitely, I, I, I have this, I'm a heterosexual. Everything about me likes women. I'm not sexually aroused by men. Uh, but that period of time in my life, it left me with a big confusion in my head. After, after, after about three months of him doing that, I finally got the courage of, to get up and get away. And when I did get away, I ended up in New Westminster, British Columbia. Now I was an addict. I was uh, an alcoholic. I was a street kid. I was angry at God for allowing that to happen. But I still went to church. I ended up in a church that was extremely fundamental. Nobody knew. I never talked about this stuff for so many years. And nobody knew where I was from or what I had gone through. And the preacher at that time had this thing about preaching against homosexuality. All I knew is that I had been had sex with a man. Unwanted. Uh, I didn't know how to deal with it. But I had had sex with a man. So when he told me that homosexuals were bound for hell, the shame that followed me around. I had guilt to start with. Now I was dealing with shame. I was no good. How could I be any good that happened to me? When someone violates you physically and sexually, it's one thing. But when a man takes God and puts God into the factor and violates you under the idea that it's okay with God and he violates his position and violates you in the process, that almost you're very lucky if you come out of that with any kind of relationship with God and uh, I had to the running from that is what led me into madness and because 
I couldn't hide behind enough books to get rid of the shame. I couldn't drink enough alcohol. I couldn't down enough drugs. I couldn't get rid of it. I couldn't run from one end of the country far enough to the other end of the country. I couldn't get rid of it. I couldn't wash my hands of the shame I felt. I couldn't. So uh, I ran for 25 years because I didn't know how to deal with it. In the process, I came into a relationship with God that's my own, and it's meaningful, and it's powerful, and it's deep. But I had to work my way through guilt, shame, madness, addiction, homelessness, uh, uh, and, uh, and a lot of mental illness, get my mind back, work my way back into society, and make myself into somewhat of a productive member of society. Something like that should have never happened to me. I didn't ask to be homeless. I didn't want to be homeless. I ended up homeless because there was a report in the um, put out by the uh, Parliamentary Research Branch of Ottawa in Ottawa called Homelessness, a National Disaster. In that report, they asked the question, what are the variables that lead men and women to the ranks of the homeless? One, I think it's one... One out of every one out of every five men is sexually assaulted, something to that effect. One out of five men is sexually assaulted before the age of eighteen. And one out of three women is sexually assaulted before the age of eighteen. So why don't you think men talk about it? It's a shame. Uh, for, uh, for a man to be raped by another man, it's The guilt that goes with it, man, I've had people, once I started talking about this and I wasn't ashamed to tell people where I'd gone and what I'd gone through, I mean, I've gone into more detail than what I wrote, but this is not this much detail. I, I don't know why I don't do that, but that's all right. The stuff that he did to me to arouse himself, to get his own perverted pleasure, uh, I'm a sh I was a sh it's a shameful thing to talk about. It's how can I've had people once I've started talking about this I've had people say why didn't you just leave why did you let it happen why does a woman allow herself to get raped she doesn't why doesn't she leave maybe she can't it's the same thing but a man it's not the masculine thing to tell somebody that you've been raped especially by another man uh, uh, there aren't a lot of avenues for men to talk about this there's not a lot of agencies uh, as much as there should be. It's not as uh, talked about in media as it should be. It's not dealt with and uh, written about enough as it should be. There's a lot of reasons why. It's a, it's a society's dark secret. Put your head in the sand and hope it goes away. Men don't want to talk about it. There's over 10 million men in this country suffer from the results of being sexually assaulted. I think it's 10.5 million men is the statistic, the number of I've been able to get out of off the information that I've done research since I've got healthy. I've done a lot of research on these issues. So there's 10.5 million men. If only half of those men talk about it, if half of those men talk about it, there's still 5 million men in a country of 35 million people that don't talk about the fact that they've been sexually assaulted. If you don't deal with the issues that uh, mean you've been sexually assaulted, there's some kind of um, there's some kind of dysfunctional behavior pattern that occurs because it's a traumatic event that happens. And any time you have a traumatic event and you don't deal with it, you're held within that traumatic event. So you got five million men at at the, just for a number. You've got five million men that aren't dealing with the fact that they've been sexually assaulted. They're dysfunctional. They're in dysfunctional families because they don't know how to deal with their issues. They're in dysfunctional relationships. They're raising children in a dysfunctional way because it's a paradigm shift when you've been sexually assaulted, when you've been raped, any of these things, there's a paradigm shift in the way that you think. And it has to happen. So that's some meat to chew on. It, it, 
is he still operating in a position? I don't know where. I don't know. He's, I don't think he's in a position like that anymore. You know, when I sat down, I went to the religious organization and I said, um, I said, I was in a drug and alcohol rehab program. I couldn't figure out why all of a sudden I didn't want to live. Everything inside of me was trying to kill myself. And I'd come into, I, I was, I, I, I'd gone to uh, the hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. The very same organization I was in when I got raped was now the organization I was in trying to deal with my addiction. Different, different church, different building, different town, same organization. I was there, I was trying to get help with my addictions. Still, at how old was I? And I think I was about 30 at that time. So from 16 to 30, I'd still been an addict. Right? Um, 14, actually. 14 to 30, I'd still been an addict. But at 16, it shifted into an addict in a traumatic, with a traumatic mindset because of a tra the, trauma, the trauma of being raped. I was there, and I went to the hospital because I was extremely depressed, extremely suicidal, and I was scared. I, at that time, I didn't want to die. At that point, death still bothered me. I got to a point later where I still, all I wanted to do was die, and it didn't bother me if I died. I tried and failed, thank God. Uh, I went, to, I was in the same religious organization, and I realized that I was on my way home from the hospital, walking home in the wintertime. I think it was October, November, October. Thanksgiving that year. It was the time of Thanksgiving. Is that your phone? And um, the time of Thanksgiving, coming home and it hit me it's because of that all this crap is happening because of Wayne that's Michael alright sorry I thought and, and all this crap happened and I realized that well it was because of what happened with Wayne. I went to the, I thought about it, I went to my counselor at that time, said, here's what's happened. This is why I'm having so much trouble. He took me to another person who was a leader, a higher up, in higher up position than him. I explained it to him and he said, shut the door. I shut the door and he said, now there is a gentleman in Vancouver who is a pastor of a church of the same organization who had this man try to jump off the bridge in Vancouver when his officer came to him he said to the officer these are the acts that I've done I feel guilt and shame for it so they knew of his behavior pattern they had a confession of his behavior pattern to them I went to the religious organization and press charges, but he was no longer a part of the church. I tried to press charges. That's another story all by itself. When you when you when a man is sexually assaulted and he tries to deal with with the sexual assault, it's looked down on by the courts. If I went to if a woman went to and I don't mean to make this look a man and woman thing, but if the men if a woman went to a police station and said this man took me aside. He, 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 I was 16 years old. I was a minor. He had sex with me. He had sex with me repeatedly. He twisted my thinking. The charges would be instant without a doubt. There would be no question. I pressed charges. The Crown Council in Grand Prairie, Alberta would not proceed forward with those charges for the life of me. I can't figure out why. I, I, I explained the situation. I was 16 years old, I was a minor, I gave a, a whole discourse to the RCMP in, in Edmonton, Alberta, and the Grand Prairie, Alberta, the Grand Prairie Crown Council wouldn't press charges. I, um, and now I, feel tw I felt twice as guilty for that. I mean, now it's my fault that it happened. It's my fault that I got raped. Because they said nothing happened. We're not going to press charges. Charges won't proceed, charges won't go through. I don't care if the charges go through or not. I want this son of a gun to stand before a judge and have to account before what he's done. 
they wouldn't press charges. I laid a $2.35 million lawsuit against the organization. And in the midst of my psychiatric dilemma, while on 1,500 milligrams of medication, uh, 3,000 milligrams of medication, 1,500 milligrams of lithium, I signed a piece of paper. I didn't know what I was signing, and I signed off on the lawsuit. Actually, I didn't even know I was doing that. So they got away. They, 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 I have points, burden of proof, nine, uh, I, I'll say five onuses of burden that I can bring up that if they're investigated, you can find out that this guy and I were in the same town at the same place. He took me to church and called me his cousin in the same church. I played in the band at that church. He got me to play a baritone in that church there. Yeah, I used to joke and call me his kissing cousin. This guy was sick. I can prove these points. And they had this confession to an officer in their organization. They had a man, this officer had pointed out to the guy in, in Edmonton that told me to shut the door, that that man had, had, uh, had confessed to him of molesting young boys. And I signed off on a piece of paper, accidentally. $2.35 million. That angered me for a while. <laughs> that got me going. But I came to a place where I learned to let it go. There's a story. I didn't. I'm going to go along these lines because this is just me. I. From the time I was 15 years old, I've read the Bible. I've never stopped reading the Bible. I've had it with me when I've been on drugs, when I've been in jail, when I've been in ditches, when I've been in shelters, when I've been in hospitals, when I've been on the highway. I've always had a Bible with me. Didn't always believe it, didn't always adhere to it, but I read it. I read it, I've read it, I've read it. It's 30, 28 years I've been reading the Bible. And I've got a good mind and it just things picked up. I read a story in Matthew chapter 18 of about uh, uh, two men that owed money. One man owed the king about a million dollars. And the king said, I want my money back now, or I'm going to sell your wife, your children, everybody else into slavery until the money's paid off. And he said, oh my God, forgive me. Give me time to pay the debt. I'm sorry. I, lo I, I, I love my family. I, I'll work at paying this debt off. The king saw his remorse and forgave him his debt. That very same guy went out and uh, found someone that owed him a hundred dollars and threw him into jail and wouldn't let him out. Sold his wife, his children, everybody, threw him into jail. And when the king heard of that, he was really upset and took this guy and put him into jail. What I understood that to tell me was that if I have been forgiven so much by the idea of Calvary, of what Calvary accomplished. And that's, uh, that goes, I'm go that's just touching because the story, you have to understand the story to understand the story of what I'm saying. But if Calvary accomplished so much for me, I owed a million dollars, who am I to go to Wayne and hold him guilty? Who am I to hold that religious organization guilty for screwing me out of the money that they did? Right? I have to let it go. And I let it go to the best of my ability. And when I did let that go, I got my mind back. And my journey home, my journey back to wellness, to where I am today, started. It started. That's good. No matter what real life throws at you, remember... You are not the only one. You are not alone. Pick yourself up. Look that issue in the eye and tell it. You will not defeat me.